For the longest time, we sort of imagined that AI would manifest as, well, Skynet. But the reality is AI is a pretty interesting part of our everyday lives in ways that we might not necessarily know. So what is it? Where is it being used? And what is it going to look like in the future in ways that perhaps we don't necessarily expect? Our guests this week are Dr. Ollie Bound from UNSW and Ray Johnson from NITV. Ray, I'll start with you. Where are we at right now with artificial intelligence? I think we really need to have a quick look at what artificial intelligence actually is, and then we can understand how it's applied in different areas. So you know, everyone's definition of AI is going to be slightly different because it is a bunch of different technologies all working together so that machines can learn and act with human-like, uh, not human, human-like levels of intelligence. Basically, any human process that we use machines or computers for, it can be sped up with artificial intelligence. And one of the uses of AI at the moment that I find really exciting is it's being used right now to analyse aerial drone photographs taken by Indigenous rangers up in Cape York. Mm. And they're looking for turtle nests and evidence of predators in the area so that they know where they are and you know how to protect the turtle eggs. And this is work that would take rangers on the ground months, you know, to do. And it can be done in around two hours, thanks to AI. And it means that in areas where there were no baby turtles surviving, you know, less than 30% of them are being killed today. So when you're looking at endangered species and the protection of endangered species, being able to use AI to analyse those photos, to tell the rangers where to go next, to bait the pigs and protect the eggs is just incredible. I'm, I'm always really excited about the applications for AI and, and the interesting places that it's being used. We're talking about technology that, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's, it is in its infancy compared to what it could be. Ollie, what would you like well, to see sit around uh, the development of AI that will help guide it into the future? I guess more tangible for most people are things like self-driving cars in terms of safety because you've got situations where an AI system might be responsible for someone's death and there's uh, obviously consequences for that. There's obviously this major argument coming from big tech that this is going to be safer and I think there's some truth in that and yet huge complications regarding exactly how how that's managed um, and I think that that remains this actually this really messy area where, where it's not going to be a very clear-cut process towards us all driving around in self-driving cars. I mean you can see this in your everyday interactions with Google um, or any of those other you know kind of common use um platforms is that they're, they're using AI in, in myriad ways to serve up information and that information or, or, or a service or an, act, an action, you know, something like how it responds to your voice and that kind of thing. From an engineering perspective, the, the major question is, you know, how well does it work? Is it 95, 99% accurate? But the trickier question is what to do when it doesn't work and, and who's responsible and what steps need to be made to rectify that there really has to be that responsibility to make sure it serves people like all technology and all design ought to do. I think there should be an expectation of transparency. I think recognising that there are people behind all of these programs is probably the most basic, easy way to approach this at the end of the day and, and understanding who has created them and why and making sure that any kind of bias that they're putting into the algorithm is addressed and stopped at the very get-go. And some of the most extreme examples of artificial intelligence kind of going wrong in this instance is in facial recognition technology that has been trained to you know detect faces. But because of who has made these algorithms, the technology that has been deployed can't tell the difference between facial features in people of African descent, mm. for example, uh, which has resulted in false arrests in the UK. It's, it's actually had real world consequences. So making sure that those teams that are making the AI are diverse in every way. It makes for a better end product that's easier for us to consume with a bit more you know, confidence and, and safety and reliability. While we can have all of the programs in the world aimed at encouraging you know, women and other underrepresented people in these areas to 
you know, work in AI to make the algorithms better for the people at the end of the day, we need to make sure that those workplaces are ready for them as well and that they're safe places for them to be working. I think it always just comes back to the human element with anything in technology. So I, I think that's what we really need to focus on to move forward in a safe way. And I think I might just give the last word to Dr. Oliver Bown. Um, What do, would you say is the biggest myth about artificial intelligence that you'd like to be paid to for once and for all? The expectation that it's going to come out like human intelligence. And I think maybe that myth is slowly changing as we actually experience it happening in the world. And one of the things people talk about with AI is that the goalposts are constantly shifting. So what we think of as AI is the thing that's going to happen tomorrow and not the thing that we've already got today. Actually, in, in one sense, one of the most interesting things is just we'll, we'll, we'll gain a sort of uh, appreciation of the diversity of ways that intelligence can manifest. All right, there is lots more of this, a whole half hour discussion on the Download This Show podcast, and it is available right now.